Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Skinner. I'm from Scholar's Choice. I'm the project manager here, and I'm excited to be able to introduce you to our part two of four with Julie Bel Air Bach as she goes through reducing screen time and discovering play. We have a lot of ECEs, a lot of teachers. I see that we have some friends come from all over Canada and I want to just give you a little bit of direction as we go through this evening. First of all, um, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to engage with us, to ask questions. There are no silly questions this evening. I want you to be able to write comments and where you're going to find that is on your right side of the Zoom chat. Okay, I want you to um, let us know where you're from. I want you to tell us your own personal issues. I know that our presenter, Julie, is excited to answer these questions for you. So I have some other great news. We have some giveaways tonight. You can win one of 10 prize packs. We are going to put together some special things for you and Julie's going to explain that later. I want you to be able to also chat with us if you're joining us from Facebook Live. Me personally, I'm a registered ECE and I'm a mom of four. And every time I come to this webinar myself, Julie gives me amazing, knowledgeable tidbits and nuggets of knowledge that I can then go back and use with my own children. So I am just so thrilled that you're here with us. So please chime in, let me know where you're from. I'm gonna just let you know where everyone is here with us. I see that we have um, Dan from London. Thanks, Dan, hi. And we have Vivian for, from Ottawa, Crystal from Kitchener. We have Darlene from Newfoundland, Margaret from Hamilton. Hi, everybody. We have Melanie from Windsor, Heather from Hamilton. We have Tara, Melissa. We have some from Kitchener and Ajax. This is great. Come on, just, I know that we had our screen time webinar last week, uh, last month uh, at seven o'clock and you wrote in to us and you let us know you wanted to change that time to eight so you could tuck in your children and read those bedtime stories. So I know that hopefully that's getting settled down and the children are tucked in, wink, wink. Um, I wanted you to know that we have amazing 20 locations, retail stores across Canada. So I know that some of these uh, participants are saying that they have visited our re retail stores. And then I, I know personally that I am from the country. So I was about an hour away from Scholar's Choice, but I did take that time. And before I worked with Scholar's Choice, I drove that hour because I wanted to actually engage with the retail staff and they gave me some great expertise and to let me know what I uh, needed for my children at their developmental level. So it was such a great thing to have that resource at your fingertips. So we have um, online, there's amazing website that you can go to, it's scholarschoice.ca. And then um, any, any information that we have coming up, make sure you get on our website and find out the new things in the future. Okay, I'm just gonna say hi to um, Sandra. Sandra's joining us from London and Megan, and Heather, welcome everybody, Oakville. Connie from Norwich, see, that's a little country, um, little county town there, and welcome. I'm glad you're here. I know that you probably 
either come to London or you go to Hamilton to go to your retail store. So welcome. We're just glad you've joined us. Okay, let's see here. Um, <laughs> even somebody said hi. Hi, Miss Jen. Hi. Look at that. So we have some professionals here, some friends, some beautiful parents here. How long does it usually last? Let's answer that. So our webinar is uh, about an hour. That's what we've um, set aside. Um, I hope that you can join us for that whole hour. So I've got some great news. If you are an ECE or a teacher and you require the professional development certificate, we're gonna have that for you at the end. So just make sure that you stay with us. It's, it's gonna be valuable uh, this time with Julie. Um, and we're going to email that to you. So if you don't happen to get that email, you just um, reach out to us at customer service and we will get that to you. Okay, so let's go on. Um, you probably don't want to hear me talk anymore. Let me um, tell you a little bit about our amazing presenter tonight. Okay, I'm going to the slide here okay and and Julie is going to talk a little bit more about those awesome giveaways I did mention that so stay with us right to the end because if you're engaging with us you here you're telling me where you're from you are now in a draw for one out of five amazing prize packs Julie's gonna tell you a little bit more about that later okay so here we go Julie Bel Air Bach. She is our Vice President of Sales for Scholars Choice. Julie, she also trains early childhood educators and teachers throughout Canada. And she is now working on her master's in MP Ed with a specialization in early learning. She has 20 years experience in early learning. Julie brings a wealth of experience to this conversation and will offer a range of practical ideas to keep children engaged without the use of screens. I know that Julie is passionate about children and supports the Scholar's Choice vision for all children to achieve their hopes and dreams. I know that you will get amazing impact and an amazing amount of knowledge and I say personal nuggets. Take the time, stay with us, and I will talk to you later. We're gonna have a question and answer period at the end. So stay with us and I will see you later. Good evening. I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with you in our second of a series of four webinars where we talk about screen time and what that means to all of us. We know that our children are on the screens too much. We know that because we see it in everyday life as parents, as early childhood educators, as teachers, we are constantly hearing about how much time children want on screens. We see it when we're in the grocery store. We see it uh, when we're driving our car and the children beside us in the car next to us are, are on screens. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a recap of our last webinar. Um, we're going to talk about the playful learning approach and I'm going to go into that more the five steps of the playful learning approach and we're going to really focus in on two, two particular uh, components of that in this webinar. We're going to talk a little bit more about getting outside and, and engaging in risky play. I've got some, uh, some photos for you that I, I think are fabulous um, and I'm, I'm interested to, uh, to see your engagement with those. Um, we're going to talk about um, that children really change when parents change. And so those of you who are parents here, this is our, your real challenge is, is to see real permanent change. Uh, this is my call to you, our call from Scholars Choice to you, uh, to really embrace what we are saying to you and sharing with you and knowing that uh, the change really happens for your child when the change happens with you. But know that we're here for you, here to support you and, and to give you great ideas that are going to encourage you to, uh, to be successful with this change. Last, last uh, webinar, we talked about that a parent's attention is the most needed nourishment that a child uh, you know, 
needs from any of us is that, is that attention from a parent. So I, as you, uh, as you're spending your evening with, uh, with us here tonight, I really want you to uh, applaud yourself and, and to really uh, take a moment to be grateful for this time. And, and I know that I'm grateful that you've taken this time and to really think about the investment that you're making in your child, because what your child needs more than anything is, is your attention. And by investing in this, we're going to give you some great skills so that you're spending that time with your child in the most productive manner. Um, we're going to talk uh, now a little bit more about reducing. Um, actually, you know what? I think I missed something. Um, sorry, on here. No, I guess not. I'm, I, I apologize. I thought there was another uh, bit to that screen, so it must be coming up in a little bit. Um, we're going to go through what we talked about last time about reduce screen time. Now, what do I do? My children are off screens. Now, what do I do? What do I do? They're, they're upset. They might be, um, you know, crying at me. They might be begging me to have more screen time. Now, what do I do? And that's really where this webinar is taking us. But let's just recap uh, the recommendations for screen time. Uh, babies under 18 months, no screen time whatsoever. That means no passing them to your phone, uh, no uh, giving them an iPad while you're changing them, uh, no screen time whatsoever. With the exception, whenever I talk about screen time, please remember I am not talking about webcasting with family that's abroad. So if you're using any type of medium to be able to talk to family um, on a screen, that, that is not what we are talking about at all, okay? Um, 18 to 24 months, only high quality media with parents watching alongside. Now I've been doing some great reading this week on nursery rhymes and language development. And I'm just going to give you this little tidbit tonight that um, what's so special about when children are listening to nursery rhymes is that the cadence is slow enough and there's pauses between the words. So Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. And so there's spacing between the words and that cadence really helps with language development. There's some great research out there. So I'm going to share that with all of you with uh, babies between 18 and 24 months. Uh, two to five years, one hour a day of high quality programming, watching with parents so that you are able to engage with the child, that you're there and you're not using it as a, as a nanny, and that uh, you know what your children are watching. Six plus um, years of age, children should have limited uh, time. Uh, not taking away from sleep and daily interactions. So remember that every moment that your child is on screens, because they're only awake so much, it is at, at exclusion of doing something else. Uh, perhaps playing, uh, working on friendships, developing social emotional skills with other children. So we really want to limit that screen time. And, and I know some of you will say, oh, my six-year-old, you should see them on on the computer, they're amazing, they're fabulous. They've learned to, to, to manage um, you know, these particular skills of this game. But there, there is a point of which they have mastered it and more time on it is not bringing any more knowledge or, or development for that child. So, so think about that as well when you're, when you're considering that. So, so these are the, uh, the figures that we gave you on the last webinar. So that's just sort of recapping. So, so really let's talk now. We've reduced the screens. You've taken some steps. And remember, if you're at five hours a day, going to four hours is amazing. And congratulations. So we know we want to reduce it more, but you know, you're not going to be able to perhaps do it all in one swoop. And if those of you can, great. But, um, but let's say you now have this extra hour a day. Now, what are you going to do? <clears throat> Sorry. What does it look like when I've turned the screens off and my child is looking at me saying, turn the screens on? So let's talk about play. The important thing for all of us to understand is that play is not in the absence of doing serious work. And some of us believe that, that play is what we do when nothing else important is left to be done. So play is important to the child, to every child. Play is the work of childhood. And this is, uh, this is a quote from Piaget, who is a noted psychiatrist who 
who really is the foundation for most of the uh, educational system that you and I are experiencing right now. A tremendous, tremendous uh, read if, if you ever want to uh, spend some time uh, looking at, at his work. This is a very good friend of all of ours, Mr. Rogers. Play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. Simple make-believe games offer children the chance to negotiate social situations and practice conflict resolution. This is Mr. Rogers. Uh, you'll see in our playful learning approach that connection between um, the social situations and practicing conflicts, which is developing social emotional skills. Play is the work of the child, Marie Montessori. Marie Montessori was a physician who had developed a educational uh, early years program. And uh, this, is, this is her approach. Now we're taking a look at three very noted early years experts, and all of them are talking about play as a serious component of learning. Now let's take a look at this stat about how your child develops. Research shows us that 75% of the brain's development occurs after birth. And, and I want you to digest that for a moment, 75%. That is a lot of developing that is needed for there to be a fully developed child. And for children to fully develop and play for early young, for, for early young children, it is the key to cognitive development. So when children play, they develop cognitively, which is their brain develops. And this is what's happening during play. And when we watch a child, independently playing, which is really such a gift, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. And I'm actually gonna send you a, a really great article uh, for you to read about play and independent play. It's such a gift to give a child the ability to independently play. And some of the skills that we're gonna show you tonight are really gonna lead you along that path. But I really want you to digest that it is through play that children brains develop, that they cognitively develop. So let's take a look at what play looks like. Uh, we're going to pull you right now and we're going to ask you what does play look like when you're taking a look. So here, let me just look over here for a minute. What is play? Uh, structured activities like soccer, uh, walk in the woods, uh, time with other children, or time at home with you showing them how to play with their toys. Or do any of those resonate with you as to what play looks like? If you could chime in on the poll, uh, that would be great. And we're just getting in some stats now. Just as all of you are voting and thinking about play, the weather is turning nice. I really want you to really think about this weekend, getting your children outside, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about risky play, letting them jump off logs, letting them have lots of, uh, lots of fun out there. One thing I can tell you for certain, I've never heard a child say I'm bored when they're out for a walk in the woods. So let's see, uh, some of you said that play looks like structured activities like soccer. Uh, some of you said a walk in the woods. The number one was time with other children. Uh, very good, very good for you. And that uh, um, about 50% of you said time at home with you showing the child how to play with their toy. And I want you to remember that one, okay? Because remember um, that you said that 50% of you said that it is time where you as the parent or as the educator are showing the child how to play with their toy. So thank you so very much for chiming in on that. And uh, we're certainly going to reference that again in a few minutes. So right now I'd like to show you what play looks like. For young children in particular, and even as children grow and develop, play is how children make sense of the world around them. From birth, the child's instinct is to begin to make sense of the world around them. So drop something and it falls, the child begins to understand gravity. How many of us can remember the child in the high chair? Dropping, pick it up for them, drop it, pick it up. You say, stop dropping it. You know, you just gotta figure out what's okay to drop because all they're doing is figuring out gravity. Let's take a look at another suggested way. 
that children learn. Lifting up heavy items. It is only when we lift up heavy items that we can understand there is a difference between light and heavy. So we need to expose children to both heavy and light items. And I have an image for you later on a, a learning invitation that I had set up this weekend. Build a tower that falls over and a child begins to make sense of structure. And uh, for those of you who joined us last time, uh, we were talking about um, children and discovery play, and we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. But remember that whenever we intervene, when a child is solving a problem, and let's say, for example, in this one, building a tower, and we intervene to tell them that the base needs to be bigger, that it shouldn't be as tall, it needs to be wider, that we actually rob from that child the opportunity to discover that learning for themselves. And we know that when a child discovers something through play on their own, independently, it becomes a part of who they are and never ever is it lost. And, and when we look at, at, at Dale's zone of, of, um, of development, that we know that, that, you know, when we, when someone tells us something, we remember 5% of it. But right down to remember 98% is when we actually experience the learning. So remember that the next time that you want to, you know, leap in and, and solve something for your child because you think they're struggling. And remember, it is through struggling that a child learns perseverance, which is a great skill to have. So there are our, our, uh, our tower goes tumbling down and, um, uh, Children learn to make sense of their world through experiential play. And that word simply means that children are experiencing or discovering. So thinking about this picture that I have in front of you, we can see that the little girl is building an ice cream cone. It appears to all of us that the parent is involved the child is leading the play. The parent perhaps is ordering off of the menu that's in front of them. And the child is building the ice cream cone in order to reflect what the order is that the parent is giving. But it is very much about the child leading the play and the parent participating. And I really want you to, to, to embrace that we want you to be involved in play, just not being the boss of the play. So what is discovery-based play? What is discovery-based play? We've got a poll for you to jump in and, and, and share with us what you think discovery-based play is. The teacher or parent is leading the play. So I tell everyone to sit down if I'm the teacher and listen to me. The children are perhaps in the house corner and I'm going over telling them how to use the pots and pans on the stove. Or perhaps at home, my child is building blocks, the example I just used, and I'm telling them how to play with it. Or perhaps there's a, they're building animals and they're making a zoo. And I go over and I tell them that the dog doesn't belong in the zoo because it's not an animal found in the zoo because they are all wild um, animals and that they should remove that uh, from that play. So a child following rules that uh, we've laid out for them, that they're only allowed one toy out at a time, that they're not allowed to mix their toys, that they need to keep everything separate so that when it's cleaning up time, we can quickly put it away. So that is one that, you know, I have to be honest with you. I've shared with you before, I had four children and I could have been found in my early parenting time telling my children, you can take out one basket at a time because it was all about my needing to clean up. I quickly learned that I could teach my children how to clean up and that we could have some great fun with really playing with multiple um, items at a time. And so here we go. Um, and the last one, which is awesome, 95% of you, um, teachers or parents leading the play, only 5% of you thought that. Uh, children following rules, not one of you, uh, chimed in on that and 95% of you said child children working with toys following their interest which is discovery-based play well done well done 
Excellent. So let's let's just take a look a little bit at the playful learning approach that that we at Scholars Choice have um, have developed, and that we believe it is through the playful learning approach that children are able to achieve their hopes and dreams. This is how a child learns, and and is when we offer them these opportunities to learn that they feel confident and accomplished, and 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 we we believe wholeheartedly that children are both capable and competent and when we look at a child as both capable and competent no matter how, what how how much they're struggling we know that what the capable and competent could at some times mean totally accomplished other times in the process of accomplishing and other times just at the infancy of discovery so but saying to yourself children are both capable and competent will allow you to embrace the playful learning approach so tonight we are going to be focusing on self-directing play so children self-direct their own play and the fourth one which is children are offered learning opportunities to support discovery-based and experiential learning so discovery-based learning which is what we were just asking you about and self-directing their own learning we feel that number one and four really come together and in a really synergistic way and really create amazing play opportunities for children I just wanted to review those again with you so that you knew and um, just so that you know in future uh, webinars we're going to be discussing uh, the other ones. Oh and children are given endless opportunities to express themselves will be uh, paired with number two in the next webinar and then finally which is going to be a real messy fun time will be children explore with all five senses which is coming up. So I'm going to ask you, what are loose parts? And it's a quick little uh, question about what are loose parts. And while you're working on that, I'm going to bring out some loose parts. So are loose parts parts to clean up off the floor? Are they Lego? Or are they small pieces of toys? So I want you to just chime in on what are loose parts. Loose parts are, um, it's, it's really a, a relatively new term for all of us uh, in education. And uh, we are really uh, emphasizing it in our early years because we do not want toys that are limited to one idea, uh, one direction that they can be played with. Uh, perhaps for an example, a parking garage. We all know what a parking garage is. It looks like a parking garage. We bring cars into the parking garage. Now let's give them parts to build a parking garage if that's what they want. Give them the cars, give them the ramps, and let them go to town creating a parking garage. That is the difference between loose parts, which are all the pieces to build whatever I want, and, um, and having the actual piece already built for me, which I don't have to think about. So, small parts and toys, 95% of you. Okay, you are like star students tonight, amazing. So here is a bag that we have constructed of loose parts. And this is going to be what people win tonight. We are giving away 10 loose parts bags like this. So in here, I have a bag of feathers. Let's see what else I have. I have a car. Hmm. Let's see, I'm gonna just put my bag down here and I'm gonna start to take out some pieces. I have a little piece of burlap. Oh, to think about what I might be able to do with that. Oh, look, I've got some wood pieces. Maybe I can build. And oh, I've got pipe cleaners. Hmm, I'm starting to think about some things. Let's see, I have a superhero who is now on the top of this tree that I have constructed. So you can begin to see how your imagination starts to run with me when I take out the pieces. Now here I have a pebble. Hmm, where am I to put the pebble? Oh, it gets even better. Oh, it crashed, fabulous. What did I learn? That this is too heavy to put on top of this branch with my little guy on it. That's what loose parts allow a child to do and to be creative. So I've got some more loose parts. I've got pieces that I can thread. 
what else? And I need to tell you that I don't know what's in this bag. So uh, we had some of the uh, um, our ECEs that work here put together this bag for me. And the goal was that I wasn't allowed to see the bag until I opened it here so that I could experience it with you. So I've got some great letters. So now think about if I'm out and I've gone to grandma's and I've got all of this available to me. And now, do you think I can play? Oh my goodness, look at this. I have all of these little animals. Oh my goodness, it's a moose. He can go on top of that. And now I've got a tiny world. Oh, I think that car needs to go. And now I have a tiny little world with little people. And they, this is a great big giant forest for them to play in. And this is how children's minds move. And through discovery-based play, you could see, I can learn about gravity. I can learn about balance. I could learn about structure. I could learn about imaginative play. I could learn about colors because this is the red one. Now, what else could I put out there that's red? Oh my goodness, look. I even have a little calico critter. He is the giant in my little mini world that I've created. And he is coming to, to the world and the superhero is going to fly in and he's gonna rescue all of us from this guy and save all of the animals. Loose parts allow children to, to explore, to take their minds wherever they want to go. In the next scenario, what I've done is I have, um, this is actually a, uh, a, a learning or a, a invitation for play that I set up on the weekend for my grandson, Jackson. And in this one, I want you to see in the middle is a stack, a pyramid stack, and they're not all perfect. I didn't put them on in any particular order. Um, I don't want everyone to think that the largest has to be at the bottom and the smallest has to be at the top. If that happens, if that's order, if that's a scheme of the child is working on, great, let's move it there. But if it's not, let's let them discover. But what I've done, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, is that these pieces of blocks are very, very lightweight, the rectangular ones. And the ones in the middle are very, very heavy. So what I was working on in this particular one was having light and heavy in the same playing opportunity. Now, I have to tell you that when Jackson came and played with it, mostly he knocked over the light ones and played with the animals. Um, I can't say that I thought that uh, we really got to the heavy and light part, but um, you know, you never know what it is that children are experiencing or discovering when they're little, because he's only 16 months old. So it is, uh, it is so important for all of us to, to set up this type of, of, of learning invitation or play invitation. So I challenge you when you want to have children discovery play that you set up something like this. Now this is a, a this small world tray. We call them the tough trays here at Scholar's Choice. And that's really reasonable. I think it's like $50, $49.99. And, and what you can do is you can contain the play. And I think it is probably one of the most fabulous new additions. Um, I was at a center today uh, with some amazing, amazing early years professionals. They were just so inspiring. Actually, I've been with them for the last two days. And um, they use this tray. Um, and, and when we put it out, we introduced it to some children today. And we put it on the floor. And you know, the first thing they did was they all came and danced inside it. Uh, because um, that's what they just wanted to experience it. And what they, they discovered was when they came over and they stepped on it, made a great noise. And so they were just discovering, um, you know, this new toy and how they were discovering it was with their whole entire bodies. And then they sat in it and then we began to bring the toys around it and then they uh, began to, um, to add things to the tray. But um, anyways, this was just an invitation for play that I had set up. And, and so when you're thinking about um, you know, working with your children or in your centers, to set up invitations to play are really a great way uh, to bring the child over to playing with loose parts. And you could put out some of those loose parts that I just showed you. So make sure that you're chiming in and asking questions because we are giving away 10 
of these bags. And what I showed you was a fraction of what's in that bag. There were some, um, so there were some great pebbles, wood pebbles, and oh gosh, I didn't even get to the bottom of it. And I was already having great fun. Could you imagine if you could have taken that to a restaurant? So focus on how to play with your children. Not, um, and, and this is how, is setting up provocations, allowing the child to lead the play, to be there as um, an active participant. You could be moving your elephant around, you could be moving your rhinoceros around, but you're not telling the child what to do, but they are leading the play. And they might say to you, oh no, 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 and get up and have to bring something and add it to the play. Fabulous, great idea. And what I really love about this tray is you could add water, not a ton, uh, but a little bit of water, and that would be really a lot of fun as well. Um, let's start with um, discovery-based play. Critical components of discovery-based play are loose parts, which we, we, just, we just talked about and, and showed you. So, so that is so important part of discovery-based play. Because if I told you, if I, if I give you a parking garage, I, I, we kind of know the play, don't we? Um, items um, of no particular structure at all are combined together uh, to be able to create anything that a child could imagine. So I was talking to you about um, the independent, is a guide to independent play. And it's a PDF that we're going to email each and every one of you after this presentation. And I'm telling you, I, I, it's just, it's phenomenal. Um, and it talks about everything from using electronic toys uh, with children to, and because at Scholar's Choice, I want you to know that that even though we talk about no screen time or very limited as the child gets older, we still very much embrace technology and the use of robotics and discovering robotics and how all of that comes together in learning because this is a part of our children's world. We just don't want that passive uh, sit in front of the screen and, and not be thinking, not having their brains engaged. And remember, they have 75% of their brain to develop. Well, they're not going to develop it sitting in front of a television screen. So um, that guide to independent play, I'll just actually show you the front screen. So look for this from us after the webinar tonight. And I, I think it's fabulous. You're, you're just going to love it. I've, I've been sharing it with some people and I was actually telling you I was with um, some fabulous uh, educators the last two days and I was sharing that with them and, and they're really excited to, uh, to also get a, a copy that perhaps they could share with parents. So, so this is really discovery-based play. Now, what do you think of this? This picture that I'm showing you, I want you to take a look at um, these children are truly self-directing their own play. So we've talked about discovery play with the loose parts. Now take a look at self-directed play. I want you to witness the child sliding down on the, on the right-hand screen on all knees and, and hands. Um, the children are in the rain. I know many of you are looking at this thinking this is a disaster, Julie. They're gonna be filthy but I'm telling you, they are going to learn and they are going to be happy and engaged. And I want to draw your attention to the little child at the bottom of the, of the picture on the, on the right, and they've got on a blue um, rain jacket and they have no socks or shoes on and their feet are in the mud. And remember when we read the book, Going on a Lion Hunt, and they talk about walking through the mud and it's squelchy? Well, I always read that word and I wondered, how does a child even know what squelchy is? Well, this child knows what squelchy is because it, you only know squelchy when you walk through mud and it goes between your toes and it's all squishy, squishy. And that's squelchy. And these are the opportunities that we want to offer children. And when children self-direct their own play, they will discover these things. So I share this with you because I was totally totally um, mesmerized by this. And it was actually, we cut these photos out of a video that was just a, a couple minutes, but just the, the delight and awe. And just watch that child as face as he hits the bottom of that slide, he went down head first. And I know that this is risky play. And by risky play, we mean that it's not controlled. 
I mean, there is controls here. That slide is safe. Where they're sliding into is safe. We know there's no rocks, um, but it's not as uh, controlled as maybe some of you might like. But I do want you to encourage to think about risky play with children and that you allow the ch your children to jump off of a log, to swing a little bit higher, to to experience that thump, thump, thump in their heart because that's what makes the life exciting. And, and for children to be enthralled with learning um, requires for children to be able to feel that. To climb a tree, uh, these are all parts of probably perhaps your childhood and mine that many of our children today aren't having an opportunity uh, to be with. So, Self-directed play, what does that look like? What does self-directed play look like for a child? Children are following their own play patterns. Some children slid down that slide on their behinds, some slid head first, some slid with their knees and hands on all four. They were each selecting their own play pattern. Some children were simply watching out the play that was going on. And the one child who was with the squelchy feet, they were watching the play. And each child is self-selecting for themselves what that play pattern is going to look like. And that is absolutely phenomenal. Just because we're out in a walk and, you know, child, one of your children wants to jump off a log, there's just as much learning going on from the child who is watching the other child jump off a log. It's all about allowing the child to self-direct. Children direct and lead the play in any way that they choose. And by that, we mean that a child is able to decide that they're going to play with animals in a certain way. My, when my uh, children were young, we had a, a lot of plush toys and um, they really liked animal plush toys uh, that reflected different types of safari animals. And they would build these great zoos for them and they would tuck them in behind um, their headboards because they were slatted so it looked like a, a cage at a zoo and they would build these great zoos and they would build them differently every time and they would be grandiose and they might take hours to build, but they were self-directing their own play. And it, what it was, it was something that was connecting with them. And perhaps whatever schema or learning pattern that they were working on was being fulfilled by this game, it's hard for me to remember. But your children are working through learning patterns. And when we allow them to work through learning patterns, and sometimes those learning patterns will be repeated over and over and over again. And you'll think, oh my goodness, why does my child keep putting everything inside of a bucket and closing it? Why does my child keep putting everything inside my boot and inside my shoe? My other grandson, he loves to put everything in shoes right now. Henry. And as much as he put applesauce inside his mother's boot the other day as well. But what he's working on is containment. So he's working on that learning, how much fits in. And, and so these are, these are why children are doing this, um, bringing shoes out and needing to fill them with things. It's okay. And he may need to work on this for a few months. Uh, maybe his mom needs to put away her, uh, her good boots. I think she's got that one covered. But this is what happens. And children are allowed to direct their own play because it's fulfilling a learning that needs to happen for them. Children who go, oh, children engrossed in play are never bored. So this is something I want you to remember. Boredom is a great igniter for imagination. Think about if we were totally entertained all the time, how would we ever have to imagine anything? Everything would be catered to us and given to us. So remember, it's okay for your children to be bored. Take out your loose parts, setting up an invitation for learning and stepping back and allowing the child to take their imagination and let it go wherever it needs to go. But boredom is an okay first step to creativity. The floor is the best place to start. You want to engage with your child, sit down on the floor. You're at their level. You're looking at them. They're sitting down with you. You're looking eye to eye. These are very intimate times for you, really connecting with your child. And this is the beginning of amazing play. 
create loose parts collections for your home, travel, or visiting, or enter the Scholar's Choice, uh, um, you know, chime in and, and talk with us tonight, and we will be awarding 10 of these loose parts. Come on out to our stores and let us help you put together some great loose parts for you, for your home. Remember, take it with you to grandma's house. Take it with you to a friend's house. If you're going to a friend's house and um, you know, you're going there for the evening and you start seeing the children do laps, running, running, running. Now, take some loose parts and put them out as an invitation for play and just watch that running start because now children are engaged. Your children will be independent and happy when they have toys that encourage discovery and allow them to lead the play. They will be happy. They will be okay with turning off the screens. But this is what's required. Our playful learning approach does allow children to be able to truly begin to develop the 75% of their brain that still needs to be developed in a healthy way in which gets them off the screens and allows them to enjoy their childhood. Children self-direct their own play. And I hope I answered that for you tonight. If not, chime in on some questions and we'll be, uh, we'll be answering those for you. Children develop social emotional skills through collaborative play. Now, we're going to be discussing this one further in a future webinar, so join us. Children explore with all five senses. I just can't wait to do this one with you. I certainly won't be wearing a dress that night. I think I'll be wearing a slicker. Um, children are offered endless learning opportunities to support discovery-based and experiential learning. And we shared that one with you tonight. The two that are bolded are the two that we discussed this evening. And number five, that children are given endless opportunities to express themselves. These five steps at Scholar's Choice, we truly believe, are the cornerstone for children's cognitive development. Our mission is to ensure that all children achieve their hopes and dreams. And whatever those are, it is our mission to make sure that we support both children, teachers, parents in that mission to ensure that children do achieve their hopes and dreams. So thank you so very much for joining me this evening. I hope that, that you enjoyed our discussion. I hope that you're ready to set out some um, invitations for learning for your children. Um, and that you understand what loose parts are. So join us on April 30th for part three, which is to learn about how collaborative play can improve social and emotional skills and reduce children's screen time. So the thread is always how to support you as you reduce children's screen time. So we are going to have some giveaways, as Jen mentioned earlier. And um, we are one of uh, 10 prizes tonight. Um, and all you have to do is to um, chime in. So um, Jen is going to join you right now and she is going to do some drops, I believe. Hi everyone. Thank you very much, Julie, for being with us this evening again. Amazing webinar. We had so much fun. Thanks everybody for chiming in and you know telling me where you're from um, and it's you know we have friends from all across Canada. I'm so glad that you joined us. Please feel free to share this webinar um, track that we're going to do every month. Please invite your family and friends and professionals. I know you are getting a lot out of this. Thank you for re your reviews. So we want to know, what did you think? What are you getting from this? Um, I want you to, you know, share review and feel free to email us and give us suggestions. Uh, we want to hear from you. Um, and uh, we are really, really looking forward to hearing your impact, the impact that we have on your children and grandchildren too. Okay, so it's a prize, prize pack time. Here we go. So thank you for everybody that engaged with us and with the team. And Julie will be back, so stay with us. She's gonna come back and we're gonna do a question and answer period. So I'm going to choose 10. Um, people that have engaged with us. 
Okay, so I have Heather, Julia. Heather, you are one of our winners. Congratulations, Heather. Okay, so Heather's won. Okay, let's see. These are our pails from Easter. I wanted you to see them. You can get your personalized pails here. Crystal Pacheco, you have won a prize pack. Please, Heather and Crystal and everyone else that wins a prize pack, please reach out to us. We need to know um, what store, location, um, go online and um, let us know what store that you're close to so we can send these prize packs. And if you're a, a fair deal away from our, from our retail, we will send that to you. We have another winner, that's Sandra McCourt. She's won a prize pack. Thank you so much for engaging with us. That's Heather, Crystal, and Sandra. Okay, let's see. Thank you again for, for sending these questions. We'll be back. Remember, don't leave us yet. Okay, Savannah House, you have won a prize pack. You know, friends, we want to make sure that your prize pack is developmentally appropriate for the children in your life. So you have some work to do for me. I know I'm taking my time here, but those that are chosen for the 10 prize packs, I want you to reach out. Let us know where you're from. Let us know your concerns. We need to know what ages your children are that are in your life. Are you, do you have a classroom? Um, are you a parent, a grandparent? Let us know so we can put some cool treasures in there. Um, Julie will personally take some time and build those, those um, amazing prize packs. Okay, you want me to come through? Okay, so I have Tara McConnell. Tara, you won a prize pack. Hi, Julie. Hello. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna let Julie pick some for me. Okay. So I have five, so Julie's gonna pick five for me. So here we go. Let's okay. see who I've are. I've got two in my hand here. Okay, let's see. Oh, Megan Sims. Megan, congratulations, Megan. And Catherine O'Neill, and and, Catherine. and and as we mentioned, we are we are going to create these uh, loose parts as specifically for the age and developmental um, skills of of the child that you're looking for them for. So we really look forward to uh, to hearing from you, Dan Duffin. Okay, congratulations, Dan. How many have I done? We need two more, Julie. Oh, two more, two more, two more. Okay, here they are. Ah, oh, Charlotte Mirless. Congratulations, Charlotte. And Melanie Boismere. Excellent. There Thank we go. Well, congratulations. Charlotte. That's fabulous. Here. And I don't know, did you see these great buckets <laughs> that we do? Sorry, I just think they're so adorable That's for Easter. I, I, um, I, have, uh, I have some done up for my grandchildren. So I'm really excited about those. And we actually do these bunnies with, that we monogram the ear. So, 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 so cute. So pop into the store. I think they're just amazing. Um, and, and, you know, don't forget about plushes being part of, and I mentioned it, it I think, about the, my, my children doing the safari, um, setting up safaris and, and zoos, and, and thinking about that plush are a great part of loose parts, too. Loose parts are not all little, little, little. Right. So here are questions that people okay. have sent in. So uh, go ahead and uh, ask away. Okay, so one of the first questions that came up was what are your thoughts, Julie, about educational iPad games, such as math development or phonics skills? I think that they're great. And as we mentioned in the beginning of our presentation, that there is reasonable and high quality uh, screen time is, is of great use. And so go on, we're gonna send you the deck um, right after this presentation. And the deck is uh, all the slides that we just did. And um, you'll be able to reference back to the, the recommended length of time mm -hmm. that you should be spending on screens. But I think that that is considered high quality screen time. Great. Okay, second question came in. How do I keep my son engaged in play, Julie? He has a short attention span at times and is usually doing two or three times 
things at the same time. Well, he's a busy guy and he's got a brain that works very fast. And so um, I think that the best thing for you is to really get down on the floor with him is to allow him to lead the play and you're gonna to have to be quick to play with him because he's going to move quickly. But really thinking about setting up those, some of those invitations for play, and, and here's, here's one, and I don't know how old your son is, so I hope that what I'm suggesting is, isn't too young. But here's one I've done before where I just use blue painter's tape and I tape a string, a, a length of it on the floor. Then the next one I might do zigzag. Then the next one I might do squiggly and I might do six or seven of them and then bring over a bucket of shoes. We were talking about shoes earlier or mittens. Put it beside them and then I begin to measure and I measure how many mitts does the straight one take. How many mitts does the curly one take? And this is activity. He needs to be busy. So I would suggest some of those things. Take a look um, at, um, you know, some suggestions like that. And also you can, you know, reach out to me personally and I'd be happy to give you, you probably wouldn't want all my ideas, um, but, um, you know, some more ideas for you to, uh, to use with him. Excellent. Okay, Julie, what's the best way to calm fears in other influencers of your child that it's okay for them to take risks? <laughs> this is a challenge and I understand it is. Start off with small risks. Don't start off with jumping off, you know, the three foot high, mm -hmm. you know, log, but start off mm -hmm. with smaller risks. Start off with with understanding that when a child has a bump or a bruise or a skinned knee, what I like to say to the child when I see that is, tell me, tell me what adventure you had. And they look at me, what do you mean? Oh, that bruise, that came with an adventure. Tell me what that adventure was. And so you're beginning to prep the child also so that when that influencer talks to them, they say, no, that was an adventure I got right here. Mm. You know, or that was an exploration or this was a learning opportunity I have. So, you know, it's really important that our words mean something mm -hmm. and that we use the type of words that encourage that risky play, um, you know, is, 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 can, can be risky. We could get a scrape or, a, you know, stub our toe or fall down and that it's all good. When a child has the opportunity to have risky play, something else happens, not just the play. They learn resolve, they can get up, dust themselves off and try again. These are the type of things, perseverance and resolve, that are so important in our character as we grow. These are real adult um, characteristics that are so necessary. So this is the other thing to share with the influencer. It's not just about the risky play at the moment. It's what it's doing to their character. So as teenagers, when they get pushed back, they are ready to handle it. You know, they know how to stand up because they've had the opportunity to experience this through risky play. Excellent. Thank you. Julie, what are some suggestions for keeping older school-aged children engaged in and in an environment where there's no electronics. Oh, wow. Well, I would say risky play is great. A pogo stick outside, lots of running. Thinking about how you might um, have games for them to play, challenges. You know, how many times can you bounce the ball? How many times can you hit it against the wall and catch it again? These are really heavy, high physical activities. I think that that's a really great one. But I do think about that I do like technology for older children after school mm -hmm. because I've been in school all day and it's time for a change. Um, my son's a teacher and sometimes I get a little bit preachy about before and after. He reminds me they're not in school anymore. They need a break from school. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is important. And I think that we need to, we need to think that for example, Lego robotics would be amazing, mm, amazing for suggestion. children. So even though um, we can't confuse technology with screens, mm -hmm. technology can be so engaging, so, co so much fabulous cognitive development happening. So consider technology 
as a positive and, and screens as, as not for an after school program. But if no technology or screens are allowed in your program, I would say get physical, get really physical because I've sat in a desk all day. I'm not interested in sitting anymore. Get me out there, have a, have a running program with those children. They can log, they can track, they can chart you know, how far we went each day. Maybe they could start a running club that, when I was in high school, I did the running club that was like the 200 mile club. And so that was a lot of fun. And we tracked how far we got across Canada. And then as a team, all of us, that was the goal. If each of us did 200 miles, we would reach across Canada. So anyhow, there's an idea for you. And hopefully that, that there's some good suggestions there. If you do want to talk about it more, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, hey, our next question, Julie. If a five-year-old child is given positive play experiences, what time allowance would you recommend? Well, we talked at the beginning about um, time recommendations. And so take a look at the deck afterwards and, and refer back to those. But I do think that when the child has had lots of play opportunities, there is time for screens, but be cautious mm -hmm. and, and make make good selections as what you're allowing them to watch because there really is a lot of garbage out there mm -hmm. and uh, that has no redeeming values at all. And really they're just one great big commercial. Um, so think about that, that whether or not the show is about teaching the child something or is it about getting the child to want to buy an end product? So I leave you with that thought. Okay, thank you. Small parts, Julie, are they good to use for toddlers? Right now in our room, we have a lot of little ones who like to put everything in their mouth. It's a great way to learn. It's a great way to learn. Um, children are necessary. It's necessary for children to put everything in their mouth. So let it go. Moms, grandmas, uh, all you ECEs out there, you already know all of this, but, uh, but it's required. It's, it's how the child is learning. We learn through our five senses. In the first um, webinar, we talked about the five doors of the brain and those are our senses. So understand that's going to happen and that's just great. But loose parts don't have to be small little pieces. Loose parts can be great big pieces. You could do uh, railway tracks in a whole bucket that they can create anything they want with it and trains to go with it. Those are loose parts as well. So think about that loose parts can be large and small, but that large pieces are still loose parts. Just create um, a collection for them so that it's not just one methodology of playing and each bin has one. Think about mixing it up so that they can uh, take them all out and, and create something wonderful. Okay. So I'm going to add this one. This one came from Nova Scotia. It says, the daycare my granddaughter goes to encourages risky play and will go outside to play no matter the weather. They have an outside classroom. Would you encourage all daycares to do the same? Well, there are sometimes limited challenges with the environment that a particular center has. And so that... Um, so I don't want us to, you know, to like if I'm in no, downtown Toronto, I've been in early years that uh, centers that are amazing that are on the 17th floor of an apartment building. So you are very, very fortunate that you have a center that has the opportunity to have this and for your child to experience this. But what I would recommend is that all centers spend a tremendous amount of time outside. Children really need to be outside. Uh, we were actually, I was saying to you earlier at a center today, and we were bringing in new furniture for them. And we were bring, giving them boxes outside in, the, um, in their play mm -hmm. area. And they were just having a blast with these just brown boxes and crawling in and out of them and the magnificent, it was a fort, it was a rocket ship, it was a house, it was all dependent on which box they got inside. But being outside, really encourage the center that your children go to, to allow risky play. Have a conversation with the director about risky play and, and what they're doing to encourage risky play for the children. Also, in addition to that, ask them about outside time, how much time the children are spending outside. 
we had a pretty nasty winter and minus 30 is too cold for children to be outside for any length of time and really they're not going to be playing outside at that temperature at all it's just too cold but when it's raining it's not too cold they can put on a rain coat they can put on wellies and the fun of splashing is magnificent so really have a chat with the director at the center about both risky play and outdoor time because it really does make a difference in a child's cognitive development okay so we're going to do a last question um the last question here uh, we have quite some about um some older children so one of the questions I'm going to ask you, Julie, here is what are some suggestions um, for, for getting your three-year-old prepared for JK? He doesn't have much interest in trying to trace letters. Um, are there any recommendations or is this parent placing too much pressure on the three-year-old to get ready? What do you think? Well, I think as parents, sometimes we can put a lot of pressure on not just the child, but on ourselves as well. A three-year-old is very young. I would start with mark making. So think about that if you give them a pen or a, a crayon or a marker, a large one, and encourage them to just make marks, that is the first step in beginning to print. Children need to first develop their shoulder muscle and the muscles in their forearm and then this arch right here in their hand must also be developed before they can print. If all of this is not developed, what will happen is it will be painful for the child to print. So what we need to do is large, great big, large movements at three. Get some paper, great big, huge paper out on the floor and let them go to town. Think about uh, perhaps some chalk outside on the sidewalk. Again, great big, huge mark making. I promise you, your three-year-old will be interested in this. Okay, so that was the last of that series. But Julie, yes. are you okay with us keep, if I just say, I know it's nine o'clock and it's past nine, but we still have a lot of engagement happening. Oh, sure, we can keep going for okay, sure. Okay, so those that need to go. Yeah. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us um, and feel free to again let us know how how you um, how you are using what we've been taught by Julie please share with us we wanted to hear your feedback um, but I'm going to continue to ask these awesome questions that are coming in if if everyone's okay with that okay so here's one Julie one of the questions that came in was where do we set these loose parts? What, what are the locations? You, they did see that you had showed them a bag of loose yes, parts. Yes, a bag of loose but parts. What other options are there to display these loose parts in your, say your house, your classroom, your childcare center? Give me some ideas of all kinds well, of ways. I love baskets. I love baskets, I love baskets, I love baskets. And so all sorts of baskets, all kinds of baskets to contain my loose parts. I also love bags, bags that open, and I could put different loose parts in and close them so that there's a mystery inside. So when the child opens it up, there could be perhaps, sorry, Jen. No, no, that's excuse okay, me. go ahead. Um, you know, some of these pebbles inside. So fun. And perhaps, you know, referring to that, the, the lady who was talking to us about her three-year-old, we could put his name inside that bag so that when he takes Ooh, it out, we could begin to, to discover his name and what the first letter is, and I could put it out for him, and he could begin to discover the different letters. So I love baskets, I love bins, I love anything that helps to contain um, them, because let's face it, loose parts cannot be all over the floor and walked all over, because they're just gonna become garbage in no time. You need to cherish your toys, and you need to, to encourage your children to do the same. We all need to be grateful for everything that we have, mm -hmm. and we need to treat our toys with respect. But at the same time, I think that, um, I love bags and I love discovery so even if you do have baskets cover them up with a, um, a scarf so that the child has to open it move it aside to see what wonder is inside children love enveloping and that's what we're talking about folding things up for children to discover 
Okay, Julie, thank you. That was amazing. What approach would you take when Oops, talking sorry. with parents who say they just play all day? What would you say to that response? I would say you are so fortunate <laughs> if your child gets to play all day. Remember that when people are talking about play all day, they do not understand how the child learns. But you have the privilege of knowing that, that a child learns through play, both discovery play, that how the world makes sense, and that we are born with the innate need to make sense of our world, to engage with people in our world. A baby, uh, my granddaughter, who is just six weeks old, strives to make eye contact with her mom and dad and coos and ooze at them because she wants so much to make that connection. It is magnificent that uh, we, are, we are hardwired for this, but how a child makes sense of the world is through play. Whether it be discovery-based play or led by themselves and creating new and wonderful worlds that they're in. But remember, when you're watching a child play, you are witnessing the wonder of learning at its very best. So encourage other people and share this knowledge with them. If they don't believe you, go online. It's everywhere. We're all talking about it. Awesome. Okay, another question that came in, Julie, was I do have some videos that help children learn letters and cite words. Again, what would you give as a limit for, say, a five-year-old for those? I think that as long as the quality is high for the program and the quality is not around selling a particular brand, then the programming is great. I shared with you that I, I love programming of nursery rhymes. I think any time that a child, um, when a child is learning to read, they need to have an auditory memory. We develop an auditory memory through songs and nursery rhymes. So when you can have a child have video time that does sing, and, and probably some of these, these programs that you're, that you're talking about, I want you to think about them. They probably are singing the songs. I'd sing for you now, but then everybody would leave. And so, but this is why these things are, because we need to develop an auditory memory. An auditory memory is remembering sounds, because when we begin to learn to read, we have to be able to blend sounds. But in order to blend, I have to remember that k was the first sound. So cat. Auditory memory is critical. And so by having time spent on programming that, that you have that's high quality, that involves repetition, uh, singing mm -hmm. um, of songs and sounds and letters, this right. is great programming. And I think that mm -hmm. just re always remember that you know, at the beginning in the deck or, or presentation, we talked about recommendations. Um, this is all new research. We don't have a 27 year old mm -hmm. study. This is a new world with screen time and the amount mm -hmm. that our children are exposed That's to. True. You know, in 50 years, we're all gonna know exactly what the, ref the, the effects of this are. But what we do know is we have seen MRIs of babies being exposed to screen time and the brain development is different so we, we absolutely say no to screen time under 18 months we know that um, we see that there's actually children becoming addicted to screen time um, as much as they are addicted to to other things in life so so these are some facts that we know so limiting screen time to high quality programming is the very best that you should be offering your children and that any time that you can say there are no screens today, and um, it's you know coming to my house is there there is no screen time um, unless it's a family time where we've decided to watch a movie together or there's something that we've seen um, that is uh, on Discovery Channel that we think that the children would really really enjoy because there's so many other things that we can do. Okay. Julie, I want you to, uh, this question came in here. There's, there's a couple questions, and thank you for chiming in, um, of children that are anywhere from 8 to 12, and then that teen group. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about, does, does 
loose parts have a part for them as yes, well. Yes, absolutely it does. Do you, um, if we were to survey a before and after school program, and we would say to them, what is the one thing that you want to add? Do you know what they inevitably put on every single survey? Lego. Mm. What do you think Lego is? <laughs> Lego is the best, the best, the best of loose parts for an eight to 12 year old. My goodness, it's just a bunch of bricks and I can create anything with it. It's just the beginning of my imagination and I can explore for days. Children are always saying to us, don't, don't take it down, don't take it apart, I wanna finish it tomorrow. So loose parts for older children looks a little bit different. It may have a, a, a construction program like um, uh, Zoobs or Lego or Connects um, where children can um, create things. Also, you know, another great loose part for older children are magnetiles, mm -hmm. uh, mag formers, magnets of any kind. These children love it because first of all, they're understanding magnets, they're understanding polarity, um, mm -hmm. and then um, they're able to create these wonderful things. So, so these are all loose parts for older children. Excellent. Julie, I know you've raised teenagers. Yes. And I'm not sure if your teenagers had phones, but I'm hearing too that there's some teens that won't get off their phone. They're watching videos. So um, what about those kids? How can we get them to step away from the phone? Do you have any suggestions? Gosh, you know, um, it's a tough it's one. Tough. It's tough. Yeah. You know, we met with someone, actually uh, one of the, uh, one of our partners at Scholars Choice and um, she, uh, she came in and she met with us and her husband is a teacher and uh, grade six, I think it was. Um, and they were sharing with us about their family philosophy of phones and they have a basket at the front door and mm -hmm. they come in and they put their baskets in their phones in the basket. Okay. Here's what I'm going to tell you you have to put your phone down first. You can't tell your child they can't be on the phone when you're on your phone. You can't interrupt a conversation with your child to take a call and then tell them that they need to get off their phones. Mm -hmm. Part of that, a few minutes ago I talked to you about there was real addiction um, happening with phones um, and it's that surge of adrenaline we get every time the sound goes off. Um, encourage your child perhaps to turn off the sounds. On my phone, I have one sound and that's the phone ringing. There is no other indicator on my phone. It's not going to control um, my every move throughout the day. Trying more and more to leave my phone um, um, at home, although I did that the other day and that was a disaster. I ended up somewhere where nobody else was and no phone to call them. So the realities of it are our new world does involve right. phones but limit your exposure to it, limit the time. And first we talked about this, it's got to change with you. Mm -hmm. When it changes with you as a parent, then you will see that your children will reflect that change. Mm -hmm. Then sit down and talk with them about as a family, how we feel about each other and how we want to be together. And it's important to connect. And so we'd like to put our phones down and try, try it. Could you go through a meal without a phone? Mm -hmm. See if that's okay then maybe you could go for a walk without your phone. Then perhaps maybe you could do two hours without a phone. But it's not gonna stop instantly. You can't make that change immediate. And it's, it's you, you've gotta start with you. You have to put your phone down and then you've gotta to talk to your child. And you know, it might start with 15 minutes of no phone. But that would be a great start. Okay. I'm going to have one last question because I know it's about quarter after. Okay. So this one came from Jennifer. It says, I have a child age 10. They are addicted to screens and reading books. Not sure. That's, that's a great addiction. All through, <laughs> <laughs> all through his childhood, he has refused to engage in most sensory activities. He popped in during this video and I asked him if he would like to play in a muddy playground one day and he absolutely would not. So we can't have any screens on in the house or he's right there. If he's not on a screen, he's in a book, but he has ample opportunities to play and discover, but he just won't. 
The other child in the house is age eight. So we have a 10 year old and an eight year old and all is over any, and she's all over any activities that's offered to her. So how do we get him engaged and this mom is just out of ideas, Julie. Okay. Well, Jennifer, I think that um, some of the some some clues in in your question, uh, but I don't know if I have all of the answers. So, you know, if you feel that my answer isn't direct enough for you or encompassing enough, please feel reach out to us um, and email us, and I'd be happy to have a private conversation with you. Mm -hmm. But you did mention in, in your question that uh, he engages in most sensory activities. He refuses to engage in most sensory activities. Some children are more sensitive uh, to sensory um, play than other children and don't enjoy it. And so that might be a clue for you. Um, the other question I would say is how does he do outside? Does he like to play outside? Will he play outside? Not everyone likes to get dirty and at 10, I'm not so sure, you know, there's probably lots of children by the age mm -hmm. of 10 who are saying no to sliding down um, in the rain, in the mud, into a mud puddle. I just wouldn't be one of them. I'd be like, like I'd be there in a heartbeat. But um, but but I understand that, and we have to we have to discover what it is that motivates our childs and move, and children and move them forward. It's phenomenal that he reads. Phenomenal. So many of the listeners tonight would love for their children to read. So really celebrate that with him. Take a look at the books that he's reading. See if you can get a thread of interest out of them, and see if you could take that somewhere. Perhaps he really likes science fiction, and you could think about uh, maybe doing some art with him and science fiction that I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe uh, he could design an alien, or he could design a futuristic world that he that he's involved in, but try and find that thread of interest for him and pull it through the readings that he's doing and see if you can start there and discover something that you could build on for him as activities outside of screen time and, um, and reading. Uh, that would be my, my, my best, um, best start. And, and remember, children are so different. Each and every one of them are such a grateful blessing and no two are the same. And, and that's what makes them so uniquely special. So, um, you know, congratulations on having, uh, you know, two children that are, that love to read. You've done an awful lot right there, Jennifer. And um, I hope that, uh, that that was of some help for you tonight. Okay, everybody. So I see there's some more questions that came in. We will take some time afterwards um, in the next couple of days and we will personally reach out to you and answer those questions. Thank you. We sincerely thank you for engaging with us and all the amazing variety of questions you had. They were point on. And I know that if you're asking those questions, we know that other parents are asking yes, you're those right, same Jen. things. Yep, you know she's what I mean? absolutely right. Yep. And so thank you for your honesty and, um, you know, just being able to share what's on your heart. Uh, because I know that your question may have helped another family that's um, been engaging with us tonight. So thank you again. And Julie, thank you. This was an amazing webinar. Again, you've given us information that's new to take with us. We always appreciate it. We're excited about part three. Yes, Come me back. too. Um, that will be April 30th. Yes. Um, so join us again. Um, make sure that you're watching your emails. Um, and if you want, you can also go to our website and find the link there. So make sure you um, continue to be with us. We want to hear from you. And again, good night. Thank you. Is there anything you want no, to say? To just thank you very end? much again for tonight. It was great. The questions were amazing. I hope that we were of help to you. And uh, good luck um, helping your children achieve their hopes and dreams. Good night.